I love it too that you have the ability to take you know a, a video like this, which is you know about this this protected uh, two way cycle track uh, along a railway, and and explain get to it very very quickly why this is so important. Mr. Barricade here to show you this pretty cool two-way facility I found in Richmond, California. This one's a great location of it because it's next to a railroad. Let me show you why. Because it's next to a railroad, there's very minimal intersections and crossing so the bikeway can be continuous and we can keep it a two-way on one side of the street. The city alternated the Zikla and the K71 so the vehicles can feel the Zikla and the K71s can be seen at night. And nobody's really trying to park near a railroad. So this is a great location for the two-way facility. If it's a great location and has minimal impacts, why not? For real, why not? <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was Vignesh Swaminathan, uh, also known as Mr. Barricade. <laughs> I asked uh, Mr. Barricade to join me uh, to talk a little bit about uh, that whole concept of bringing uh, active transportation and transportation dialogue and concepts out to the world of TikTok. Uh, I think it's a fascinating discussion. I hope you enjoy it too. So let's get right to it. Vignesh, uh, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you for having me, John. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> One of the things I love to have my uh, guests do is just kind of take a moment to introduce yourself. So tell us who you are. Sure. So my name is Vignesh Swaminathan. I'm the CEO and president of Crossroad Lab, where I act as principal. I also do a lot of drafting. I, uh, I also sit as a few political roles in Cupertino. I'm the chair of the Sustainability Commission and uh, uh, just now on the Economic Development Committee and um, it would VTA, which is the Transit and Congestion Management Agency for the whole uh, county. Uh, I, I sit as a chair of their advisory committee. Um, I, the Crossroad Lab, the firm that I run, is a civil engineering firm. We, we've been branching into more planning and outreach and environmental and traffic. Um, we mainly are a civil engineering firm designing and developing uh, safer streets uh, and safer off ramps. Um, a lot of our work revolves around protected intersections and protected bike lanes, which I've been spearheading for many years now. Um, and many of you may know me as a Mr. Barricade online, where I use uh, short form video to communicate to folks uh, many different elements of transportation. Um, so they're kind of prepped, it's, so the community's prepped as to how to deal with these decisions when, they, when they're at face with them. I love it. I love it. That's great stuff. And let's pull up your, your website, which is right here. And I was poking around here a little bit earlier and, and taking a look at the, some of the, the projects that you're doing, the design that you were doing. And you're right. I mean, pretty, pretty standard, hardcore civil engineering stuff. And you mentioned, uh, you know, before we hit the record button that you're kind of a classically trained engineer, you know, sort of in the highway standards and, and movement on that. And you also mentioned that you were like getting into the nitty gritty of stuff, you know, like the details of, of, you know, the to, down to the decimal points of, of curb mm -hmm. ramps and all this kind of stuff. So you really come at this from an active transportation perspective and then a, a transportation or a, an engineering perspective with that context of like getting down to the details of getting the details right. Is that about correct? Yes, yes. Um, I, I started as a, a parking engineer. I thought parking was the most important thing when I was in my youth. I wanted to work on that and see how we could kind of make people walk more and make parking more efficient. And then I learned there was a whole world of parking where I actually managed uh, marathons, concerts, and festivals. So I was the person who would uh, coordinate during a marathon where the barricades and cones would go. And I got the nickname Mr. Barricade back then. Um, and it, it was, and, and it, I would coordinate with many, many different types of people, with police, with volunteers, with security. Uh, and and, and uh, it was different from engineering immediately. It wasn't just talking to straight engineers and working through red lines. It was working with folks and creating diagrams that were really easy to understand so a volunteer could learn to shut down a street. And uh, from there, I, I learned that you could really change the culture of a street within a few uh, minutes, within a, uh, within a few hours, suddenly the road went from a busy a roadway, five lanes, to suddenly a marathon where there's music and there's a concert and there's even a little beer garden. And uh, that really opened my eyes to kind of how we could quickly change roads. And then I went to work for, 
a highway consulting firm designing freeway interchanges for a while. Did a lot of widening, um, widening of freeway interchanges, and I saw some of the ills of that. I remember taking a lot of property for some projects. I was always a little, uh, uh, kind of got, started getting annoyed that, oh my God, all these properties, the names are from one cultural group, where I just started seeing a lot of ills in, 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 in that. And, um, and then I also started, that the company started to work on more complete streets projects because the highway projects started to dry up. And at the time, I was one of the main highway designers kind of modifying highways for active transportation. So creating ADA facilities and bike lanes and even some protected bike lanes to cross freeway interchanges, bike paths to be next to freeway interchanges. And I learned a lot about grading, drainage, utilities, swales, and a lot of environmental from that. But then I, when the company started to work on complete streets projects, I started to feel that those projects were not going to get delivered. The way that they approached the project was from a very highway perspective, where they wanted they were widening the road, they were putting in new trees, swales, and doing a lot of additional stuff, additional disciplines, and just keeping the roads safe. And I worked on a few major projects, huge corridor projects, and I realized that we're kind of bankrupting these cities. Um, the, we're, the, the this huge bill of the consulting fee that was going on for many years. And the design is very detailed and the city doesn't have money to deliver that actual project. And that project ends up getting phased into multiple uh, uh, CIP projects or they end up giving it to a developer to build because the city does not have money. And so I was very inspired by my combination of my barricades and cones experience uh, you doing traffic control uh, and, and the complete streets. And I felt I could kind of innovate in the quick build space. Um, I, I saw a few folks doing that, like uh, um, uh, like I saw the t tactical urban plan, urbanist plan that was showing how to close down streets for block parties. And as a civil engineer, I, I, doing freeway ramps, traffic control, I felt I could use the same elements in protected bike lanes and protected intersections. And that's what started Crossroad Lab. Got it. Got it. I love that that background. That's so fascinating. Um, my good friend Chuck Marone uh, likes to talk about the fact that at those big events, you know, it's where, where you, you have this massive, oftentimes massive mixing too, of, of pedestrians, people coming out of the event, you know, sort of this pop-up sort of parking environment and how, uh, people kind of, you know, are intermixing and mingling. And there's, there's an interesting lesson that is, is there that can be learned in terms of even shared space and how, uh, you know, you get this kind of dynamic that just sort of happens. And so that's kind of cool. And then, uh, also speaking of parking, um, again, before we hit the, the record button, we, I mentioned, uh, you know, that I had, uh, Donald Chup on as well. And so that was a fascinating, you know, discussion, really diving deep into, uh, you know, the intricacies of, you know, our relationship to parking, because parking is a very, very interesting, uh, dynamic. It, it's, it triggers emotional responses in people when, 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 when you get there. And, and I realize that isn't exactly the same as, is kind of the, the big event parking. Um, although there might be this expectation that there better be parking for us, right? <laughs> so, um, that's good. But the other interesting thing that, um, that, that kind of, you know, peaked there was, um, was also kind of this revelation that you were having, which also speaks to uh, Chuck Marone and his most recent book, uh, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. Have you had a chance to read that book yet? I, 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 did, I did read that book. It's a great read. And it really aligns with a lot of the same things that I've realized through my, uh, my career. Um, uh, kind of talking about those, both, both those points is, as a parking engineer, I learned a lot of the, 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 the mentality of other of the, of the city and other parking engineers there. I was a very small group. We were in downtown operations for the city of San Jose. And it was about making sure that downtown had economic growth. And we were, at a time, it was about, we thought that parking is the only wallet delivery system. It's the only way that to bring money into the city. And then we just, that, that wasn't doing very well for the walk downtown and people weren't really walking, but people, we were focusing on all the street parking and the garage parking. And then when we started doing more of these events, uh, we were like, oh, parking is a driving force because so many people come to the event, they park at the concert and they start going in. And then the rest of the time, the city was kind of dead. And then the mentality started to be, let's make more people live in the city. 
Let's make the city a more of a place to thrive. And so uh, moving, figuring out how to move people on bikes, having bike parking, figuring out and secure bike parking with a bike valet, figuring out how to coordinate people and put signs near the different bus stops. So people knew how to get to the event and, uh, um, and including parking was really bringing in the drive, bringing in uh, activity in the city. And then, after we started doing that, more developers started to build buildings in the, in the city. But there was a time when I started back in 2009, 10, uh, that um, there wasn't a lot of economic growth in the downtown. The economy had just tanked and developers had cranes up but weren't building projects. And um, I, I felt that us working on that really grew as a big driving force in the, in the growth of the San Jose. Yeah, yeah. All right. Enough of all this boring talk about parking and stuff like that. Let's 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 get to the real fun stuff like Mr. Barricade. <laughs> uh, as I start to prepare to to, to play one of your, uh, your your videos, I want you to give us the background. How, how did you get the idea to start putting some of your content um, out on TikTok? Well, I, I, to be honest, I haven't really been a social media person uh, most of my life. I actually didn't have a Facebook most of my youth. I, I, I use it when I was in high school, but then I didn't use it through college. And I didn't really, uh, all my friends would have to text me if there was a party or something for us to do. I wasn't really on those, on those platforms. Um, I was on Reddit uh, when I was a when I was a young enge- younger engineer and before I started. And I was started to post some of my protected bike lanes on Reddit. And uh, um, people were really intrigued because they haven't seen that kind of stuff before. And I was like, hey, what should we do? Should we angle this this way? And I realized at that point that I was working on one of the most advanced intersections in the country. I was working on one of the first protected intersections that had a bus lane down the middle. um, And it was a really, really advanced intersection. And then uh, um, uh, I I realized that a lot of people had never even seen that before and never worked on before. And the Internet was very intrigued. I started a small website where I was designing bike lanes for people on the internet. Uh, if, if there was an activist who wanted it uh, from Reddit, they would, could reach out to me. The website was called Walk Access Bike Way. And uh, I knew there was a huge call, a need for that on the internet. And so then that inspired me to start my, my company. Uh, and then after working on my company for a few years and designing a lot of these protecting intersections on our own, we built a San Jose project and more. Uh, uh, I helped write the "Don't Give Up at the Intersection" document, and that that kind of blew up the the space for a lot of other cities and agencies to start incorporating this kind of stuff. And then some of the bigger firms started to do this kind of work, you know. And 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 I started to getting cut out of that space actually uh, because of these bigger firms were dominating the space as a small consultant, a boutique consultant. It got kind of a little difficult. But we grew in terms of doing community outreach in a unique way. So we would have uh, uh, pop-up parties on the block to talk about the actual street. We did quick build where we had many, many people come and walk the the bike lane and collect outreach. And and then the pandemic hit. And so we couldn't have any of these block parties with the kids doing chalk on the ground and stuff like that. These are kind of local outreach that the big companies couldn't do. Right. And um, I felt that I, how can I communicate to people if I can't bring people out to the project site? So then I was yeah. inspired by my knowledge that a lot of people have interest in this online. And I started filming these POV videos because at the end of the day, when you do a community outreach plan, you show an engineering plan set. Not everybody knows how to read that. And if you go through a point of view of this is how you interact with the facility. These are the hard things you deal with. You're walking, this is what you see. You walk past this tree, you cross this crosswalk. You're driving, you make these turns. And that POV uh, 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 perspective, I think, is, is, is super invaluable for our, how people use our infrastructure. And so I started filming those kind of videos about our projects to kind of show, hey, we worked on these innovative projects and this is how you use them. And uh, it, really, it really grew from there. Yeah, I love it. And I've got this one queued up because this will also queue us up for uh, popping over to the NACTO. Don't give up at the intersection. So let's uh, let's play this and uh, and talk about it when it's done. Hey, y'all, Mr. Barricade here on the Santa Mas Aquino Trail in Santa Clara. This trail is about average because it's skinny. There's a lot of noise, and you're really really close to cars. But it's even more below average because it ends at every single intersection that tells you to yield to pets because they needed to prioritize the free right turns. They needed to have a 16, 18 foot right turn pocket. And so they couldn't get the trail to actually work its way all the way to the signal and design the intersection. This is why I wrote the book with Nacto called Don't Give Up at the Intersection because engineers like to give up at the intersection. 
I love it. <laughs> so much fun. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you for, for, for doing that. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work with uh, NACTO as well. I try to uh, help film and document some of their uh, workshops during the, uh, the, the annual gatherings. So uh, I hope to, you know, to be there in, in Denver this coming year. Uh, hope keeping my fingers crossed that we don't have any, uh, you know, conflicts that, that might pop up. But uh, yeah, so talk a little bit about how you got engaged with uh, working on, on that particular document with NACTO. Sure. So, um, as you know, a lot of engineers with their standard details, they like to leave the intersection blank because they want to put the liability kind of on the user. So that's why a lot of bike lanes go dashed at the intersection um, because then they don't have to worry about the being liable for the conflict. It's on to the actual user. And so I was hired by NACTO in San Jose to actually do the entire San Jose project. It was funded by the Knight Foundation. And we did that because it was an accelerated route because the city's procurement process would take two or three years to even start a project. Um, San Jose is very slow at that. And, and, and just to circumvent that and deliver a, a huge project, the Knight Foundation really wanted to do this accelerated work. And we were a small company and we've been doing this. We had more expertise than most. And so we did a lot of the downtown, uh, the whole downtown network with protected intersections. And through that, I learned some a lot of the the conflicts I had with the with the engineers there about not wanting to do this and leaving it blank. And with all the research that we did from that project and all the documentation and trial and error and working with the community, we developed this document: "Don't Give Up at the Intersection," and use a lot of best practices that we learned in the in the downtown project. Um, that include a lot of these posts and paint quick builds and how to make them bright. And 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 taught a lot of engineers about the different conflict points and the radii that we used, and it just was a lot of documentation of, of an actual real world project. And you'll see a lot of the images are from our projects in San Jose. Yeah, I love it. It's good stuff. And uh, yeah, you scroll down, you get to the the, the group here. Of course, uh, Jeanette Sadakan um, is uh, on the executive board there, and then there you guys are right there um, yep. with Joe and with Elta and, and, and you guys. Great stuff. Um, <laughs> so I, I love this too, because, you know, a big part of what I've been trying to do with Active Towns over the years is, is, is part of the struggle of doing some storytelling to better explain and engage uh, a broader population. And uh, I have to say that, you know, I haven't yet dipped my toe into the, the, the TikTok world, um, although I will admit that uh, I actually did sign up today. <laughs> so that I could access your, your, your account out there. And so, but, but talk a little bit about that. Cause you went from zero social media, you know, to jumping, you know, two feet into the world of TikTok. Yeah. What was that like? It was, it was, it was actually, it went, it was, it went through phases. It was quite scary. So, uh, I, way I felt it is if we can't reach people uh, in outreach meetings and we can't have people don't like to go to websites, you put a, if I put a QR code on a project sign, more people access that than any of our outreach efforts. And so I knew there was a need for, for us to use a phone. And if people are already scrolling and watching dance videos or whatever video is on TikTok, then if I can put educational videos in their feed, then they just learn something. And the TikTok, it, my goal of that is not necessarily to reach activists and, and professionals like uh, like most other social media platforms you would think, right? My, my goal is to actually reach the average citizen, just the, anybody who actually has no connection to a roadway, who just uses the road, but actually doesn't really care or know to care about the roadway system. Um, my goal with the TikTok is, is for that. I use LinkedIn to reach out to my other professionals and I'm using Mastodon and Twitter to reach out to more activist groups. But a TikTok is really to just reach out to just anybody. And what happened to me is in between Zoom calls like, like this, I would be waiting and I would maybe film some video dancing at my desk uh, to music that I liked from my youth. And uh, some, of the, some of the people on TikTok had never heard that music because it's from early 2000s or so. And once I grew a little following just from making dance videos just at my desk, um, I got to 200,000 followers that, from just doing that. And then I realized- I have, to, I have to interrupt you for a second here because yeah. I'm scrolling through your list here and I'm like, okay, you know, yeah, we've got like, you know, 100,000, 80,000 and then 
boom, 1.2 million views. You got to be kidding me. Yeah, no, I, we average about 10 million views a week on our, on our TikTok channel. And that's because of these combination of these dance videos and also my engineering content. And I have following people may follow me for the dance video and then they get shoved with engineering content. And, and, and that's my that's my my intent with this. Um, the reason my videos do well is because I, I am I, uh, I, uh, um, I, I, I kind of reach both types types of uh, uh, content. I actually am there's a meme about me uh, in almost all my comment sections. People write, write the same comment saying, I don't know how he does it, but he perfectly balances uh, industry niche content and trending content. And, and because uh, that's kind of what I uh, have been doing and people see that and they joke about that in my comment section. Yeah. I think that's, it's brilliant. And, and A, kudos on you for, for, you know, just jumping in and doing this. And like you said, it was probably a little scary there at times and, and, you know, trying to do that. And I, I, I want to get to this. I want to see what, what that first, you know, 1.2 million was all about. So this is like a crosswalk. Yeah. This is yeah. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great Yo, video. Mr. Barricade here, and I'm really excited to show you this new school crossing we installed in front of Gilroy High School with curb extensions and with the flashy yellow lights. And we didn't trigger any environmental review. Let's check it out. Who's that young guy? <laughs> my, my, fa my facial hair goes up and down and yeah, throughout the year. <laughs> so out of nowhere. So we added all the right warning signs, the flashy bumps, the posts, and the city's first buffered and green bike lane. The school drop-off circulation wants it to be a one-way, so we added this curb extension here to make it unappealing to exit and also to give directional ramps. This curb was added on top of the existing pavement, and we kept the drainage where it was, and we put in these new ramps to make it all flat and ADA compliant. So now when I press this button, I'm able to cross the street with ease, and cars are already yielding to me. This is a very rural town, and we only scope to do this one intersection. So we necked a 26-foot lane down to an 11-foot lane with a taper, and we ended the bike lane with a dashed green. We also added this little curve with the crosswalk right here, so any bikes can cross and go. I love it. It's uh, and, and Gilroy, of course, uh, famous for garlic. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And then, <laughs> I know my California. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's so it's a fairly it's a farm town. It's becoming more urban right now, and this was one of their first uh, uh, bike lanes and crosswalks. And you can, like I pointed out, that that lane is twenty six feet wide, mm -hmm. and uh, we reduced the lane width to a normal lane with eleven feet wide. But that's new to them. Oh my god! Yeah, reducing our lane width from twenty six. How could you do that? Um, but uh, the, I, the, using a short form video and using kind of simple words, you notice I didn't use pedestrian hybrid flashing beacon. I used flashy yellow lights, right? I use right, flashy right, yeah. bumps, right? I'm not, and it, I'm not necessarily trying to confuse or, or flex my terminology to the average person, right? And I felt that when I did community outreach meetings, that was a lot of what the planners and engineers were doing is, hey, we're going to spend a lot of time to talk about all these terms and we're going to talk about all the goals and needs of the project and all the volumes and w w how we're using the funding and the questions people would ask in the community outreach meeting were very disconnected from that i remember to, one of the things that really spoke out to me is i remember showing a plan set and talking about all the goals and the volumes and having the plan set in front of people and talking about how we're going to adjust u-turns if we block off certain movements and stuff and this lady was staring at me and she's super engaged and just listening and then she asked me, so where's the big oak tree? And I was like, oh, it's over here. And she turned around and she's like, oh, now I know where we're at. And like, right, oh right. my God, you talked about all this stuff and she doesn't even know where we're at, you know? And so there's a yeah. huge disconnect in how we communicate to the community. And uh, yeah. um, I, I, I felt that using these videos uh, in a short way, if you can watch it on mute, it makes sense. If you can watch it, it fit it into uh, 60 seconds, it makes sense. Um, and, uh, uh, and I try to have fun with it. That's great. And again, you're, you're, you've got 1.6 million followers, uh, at, at this point, uh, which is just fantastic. And, uh, is the, is the, I'm, since I'm not super, super familiar with the, the platform is, is it pretty much all short, uh, video? Is it, is there a limit to the amount of time? 
So you can go up to 10 minutes, but I've, I haven't really experimented with that yet. Most of my videos I try to keep under a minute uh, or 45 seconds even. Um, I, I just, if I, the video, the first video we showed with the don't give up at the intersection document, I was just biking home from work and I just saw it and I was like, I'm gonna film this real quick, filmed it in one shot and just kept on biking. And I think that kind of authenticity is what a lot of people on TikTok does really well on TikTok. There's sometimes videos that are really edited with, with a bunch of text and, and stuff and that sometimes doesn't do as well. Um, but people want to be able to be informed in a really short way. And uh, I think just the attention span of, 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 of folks on TikTok is, is pretty short. Um, I'm experimenting with longer form video on my LinkedIn and to professionals. If I do like a, a talk like this or if I'm giving a presentation, I experiment with that on different platforms. But the TikTok platform, especially because there's a lot of youth on that platform, it's just very, very short form. Um, and using the different uh, sounds or different audios, um, the, I, I tried different things. I had a, there was a, there's a group that I, you might see that comment a lot on my page, but there's a group that I listen to called Drain Gang. I've been listening to their type of music for a long time, for the last 10, 12 years, and now they've got some new popularity. And I uh, use their music to teach people about drainage. And just because I think, it, I think it's, drainage is so important for our infrastructure. It's, it's, it's everything. A, a lot of things, times when our products are held up because of drainage concerns and environmental concerns. And so um, I try to use different sounds and different jokes and, and trends to teach people about infrastructure. I love it, too, that you have the ability to take, you know, a, a video like this, which is, you know, about this this protected uh, two way cycle track uh, along a railway and and explain, get to it very, very quickly why this is so important. Mr. Barricade here to show you this pretty cool two-way facility I found in Richmond, California. This one's a great location of it because it's next to a railroad. Let me show you why. Because it's next to a railroad, there's very minimal intersections and crossing so the bikeway can be continuous and we can keep it a two-way on one side of the street. The city alternated the Zikla and the K71 so the vehicles can feel the Zikla and the K71s can be seen at night. And nobody's really trying to park near a railroad so this is a great location for the two-way facility. If it's a great location it has minimal impacts why not? For real, why not? <laughs> so I, I love that, and I love, and like you said, you 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 because of your engineering training, you're into the, this level of detail. Another video that really gets into to some of the detail. One of my favorites of yours is uh, is the access ramps uh, with the protected uh, bikeway. So let's take a look at that. Hey y'all, Mr. Barricade here in downtown San Jose and one of the protected bike lanes that I designed. When doing quickable protected bike lanes, it's really essential to think about access management. Right here we have a freight loading zone. And when you have a freight loading zone and you drop off people, especially the elderly or people in wheelchairs or even somebody who's just dropping off goods, it's really, really essential to install a curb ramp. A curb can be a barrier of entry for people to access buildings or even just get up on the sidewalk. And so adding a ramp makes all the difference. In this location, having a curb ramp next to a senior home provides access for the community to use paratransit, Uber, and for folks to drop off whatever they may need. Relying on driveways is not enough because driveways can be steep and not ADA compliant. It is essential to not design for the majority, but to design for the most vulnerable. That way we can provide access to all and more people. Again, these are not like super, super complicated things, but it's that level of detail that many don't think about. And since you are speaking to a broad audience in the, in the, the community, it's like, you know, the light bulb goes off and I go, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Uh, to a lot of engineers, they might not even think to put a curb ramp next to a loading zone. Still, um, actually, yeah. to most cities, they probably don't even think about that. And so, I, I, through my experience, I've, I've learned that these are the kind of important things to care about. Through my community outreach as an engineer, I've learned all the different values of 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 of, 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 of the people's needs. And these short form videos actually also help for me to practice explaining things in a, in a short way. Um, it, it, when we did this quick build project, it comes with a lot of pros and cons. And a lot of cities, they execute these quick build projects fairly poorly. They usually hire more of a highway consulting firm and they don't think about all these details. And when we worked on San Jose, we approached it very differently than I think any other uh, project was approached. 
in San Jose, we uh, instead of doing cross sections and showing all these street mix cross sections and telling people about why what, what the protected bike lane was going to look like, I actually first drew the entire project at a 10% level of detail. And it was just a little CAD lines and I zoomed in on every single block and we went to every single business owner and we're like, this is what we're doing to your street, your, your front frontage. And that was very different than most consultants would do it. Most consultants would show a cross section and like, this is happening. What do you think about it? But we drew exactly what we're doing in front of every single block with the metered parking space. And we talked to them about that and the level of detail in the first run. And that's just because I'm a CAD person. I can do CAD fairly fast. My team is all CAD folks. Um, we don't really mess with Illustrator and a lot of these other tools that other planners use. I think a lot of that is, in my opinion, a waste of time. Um, it's good you to communicate something to make it look pretty, but at the end of the day, it's not always feasible. Um, and making sure that you show what's feasible, what you're interacting, what's the tripping hazard is really what people care about. Um, and whenever I do one of these projects and I, 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 I'm able to communicate that, then the, the business owner or the person who is able to be like, yes, that's my bench. That's my that's a, the sidewalk I cross every single day. But if you talk about these big ideals, a lot of time it just goes over their heads and it only aligns with the activists. And the activists are always going to be they, co com saying the same thing. Um, when I think about my videos, I think about four categories of people. And I know it's not good to generalize, but if I could generalize for a second to just think about my audience, I think about uh, the NIMBYs, people who are just against the project because it's next to them. You know, it's, they have their own business, they have their own life, and whatever you're doing as a change from that is, is scary, right? And so talking about what the changes are and how the people will be impacted of all types of people, including drivers. Then I think about my single disciplinary activists. Oops single disciplinary activists who are just focused on one thing. I care about the same things as them. I care about the trees. I care about the bike. I care about the access. I care about equity. I care about the same things. We're trying to bring that up, but there's a lot more disciplines involved in, in delivering a roadway project. And then I think about the interested and concerned people, young families, people who want to do the right thing. They want to teach their kids the right thing. They want to make sure that, that the community is not gentrified too much. They want to make sure that it still looks nice. They, they, they just don't know the right terminology. They don't know who to align with, and but they want to participate. And then I also think about like your marginalized community, people who are disconnected. Maybe there's a language barrier. Maybe they're undocumented and they don't feel comfortable talking about the project. Maybe there's some sort of other adverse thing that's happened between them and the city that they just don't feel comfortable talking to the city about that. And uh, uh, maybe there's a, a visual impairment or, 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 like I said, language barrier. And I think about these different that, 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 that fourth group. And when I make one of these videos, I'm trying to address all four in one of those videos. I'm not, I could make a video just for one group, but then I, it doesn't hit home with everybody. And I think that's what a lot of my videos do very well, because if you only hit it with one group, if I only talk to the activist community, if I only talk to the professionals, people will see that for a few seconds and they'll scroll. They'll just be like, this is not really for me. Right. Um, but if I talk to all four groups, uh, then it, it kind of resonates with everybody. Yeah. And, uh, and you mentioned it earlier too, is that, you know, having the point of view of, you know, a, of a person on a bike or a person walking or a person on a scooter, uh, also, you know, helps invite people to come along with you. And, uh, some of my most, you know, popular videos that aren't in the podcast realm are in fact, those point of view of, of, you know, me on my bike, you know, the, the video I, uh, you know, basically posted yesterday. Uh, this was you know, recorded on uh, December 15th. So on December 14th was me riding around Delft, you know, in, in the Netherlands. And so, you know, it was just like, hey, come along with me. I'm going to shake off my jet lag and go for a ride. <laughs> I'm inviting you. Come along with me. So one of the things I love too about the the, the videos that you're producing is is you are kind of blending these, these, uh, exp explaining of, you know, Hey, what is a protected intersection as well as kind of highlighting this lighter, quicker, cheaper ethic of let's get stuff done. Let's, you know, let's get it going. So let's, let's play this one. And then I'm going to follow this one up with a, another type of video, which is uh, a point of view of how to do something. So let's give this, this a shot. Uh, Mr. Barricade here to show you a fully protected intersection with all four corners protected in San Jose, California. This is Almaden Road and San Fernando right here and it was designed by yours truly. Let's check it out. 
the vehicle stop bar is placed right here. That's a good 20 to 30 feet from where the bicycles wait in this forward bicycle box. And so when a bike approaches the intersection, they come way to this bike box while the vehicles are waiting back here. And when the green light goes, the bike gets a head start in front of the vehicle to reduce the risk of any sort of crash on a green. All right, I'm going to pause just for a second because I want to ask you a question about the response from your audience when you get into that level of detail. Uh, people, you just they just get it. It's physically there. You know, I don't need to explain it saying this is a, a forward stop bar or this is a leading pedestrian interval or I, I don't need to explain that. I just get it. Like the bike's all the way over there. The car's over here on a green light. The bike's gone and the car goes. And what you'll see right here is I'm actually walking in the car lane and to show people what the car's experience is. And we know 10,000 people per lane per day and most car track, most, most lanes. And so a lot of the users who we, we talk to are drivers. And so they just, they see this stuff and they're like, oh, what is this? This is freaky, I don't get it. But showing it from their perspective and explaining what the car is dealing with is super valuable to, to making sure these are uh, successes. Nice, let's radius. continue. We put a very tight radius here, so a vehicle is forced to slow down when making this turn and they view the bike at a better angle and not in their blind spot. And so when a bicycle wants to make a left turn, they cross on a green phase and they come right to this box and they wait here for the next phase, which comes right after. This helps inexperienced cyclists, people in scooters, and folks in mobility scooters. So come check it out in San Jose, California. Yeah. And that next video, in fact, uh, takes takes the viewer along on a ride uh, to figure out, okay, how, how do you do a two-stage left turn or a, a Dutch-style turn? And so that's what this one is. Hey, y'all. Mr. Barricade here, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to make a left turn at a protected intersection. Let's check it out. On a red phase, you approach the intersection and you wait at this forward stop bar in front of the cars. When the pedestrian sign turns white and the green light goes, you get a forward start before the cars get to make right turns and I come wait right here. And I'm on a bike but I'll still go when the pedestrian signal is up and I make a left turn very easily. And that is how you make a two-stage turn. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, you got to think that, that even with us installing that, if we, the city didn't do a lot of outreach, or maybe the outreach is there for a little bit of the time, maybe there was a few signs there, but doing one of these videos, some of these videos get millions of millions of views. And it, uh, I think that first one has one point something of views. And that for a lot of people, even cyclists are like, oh, I get it now. I didn't understand that. And we have a lot of uh, hardcore cyclists out here that ride with cars. That's their as their passion. I know there's a, that's what's taught from the American League of, of touring cyclists and, and stuff like that. And, and so they ride with traffic. But for a lot of them, knowing how to cross in just two stages is still foreign. And so um, showing it from that point of view is, is just invaluable. Um, San Jose is, is, I think, is the only city that never banned any of the scooters. Um, and that is because when the scooters started to come out in the Silicon Valley back in 2017, uh, January, we were already started on the project. You know, we were already just, we were going to build this entire network of bike lanes into downtown. And San Jose said, if we're building the network of bike lanes, let's not ban the scooters, let's build this. And I, I'm proud to say that all of our projects have been started and completed in less than 10 months. No, none of our projects have been over a year. And most most uh, engineering firms and cities aren't able to say that because they get hung up on a lot of the environmental review and uh, a lot of uh, uh, design changes and stuff like that. But the way we, we got around that is we went straight to CAD and we made sure to not modify any drainage facilities. And so that way we didn't trigger CEQA for a lot of our work. Um, we didn't we didn't modify any of the turn pockets. We made everything work with the existing turn pockets. And me knowing how to navigate CEQA, I didn't want to be one of these consultants that was going to make money off of delays with CEQA, which most consultants do. That's actually what most consultants make money off of is delays of environmental review and changes and working with the different regulatory agencies and they bill for that. But I just really wanted to get projects done. And so um, we build projects for a lot of the tech campuses around here. Um, so we built the inside of their campuses and the outside of their campuses. We work with developers and we work with a lot of cities uh, on designing things quickly. And now we've actually got to the point where we're designing um, embedded curbs and raised protected intersections with drainage in less than 10 months. 
Um, and uh, it, that's just from my accelerated review and accelerated communication and, and just education of our city staff uh, and decision makers through either social media or other presentations. And I've just learned that communication is the main thing that we have to do. Uh, doing, just drawing the plans and submitting it for review and just going through the redlining and charging hours is not the, the right way that I want to operate my business and not right, the right way that I think cities can afford. Are cities starting to tap into your expertise and your uh, your plethora of videos and like linking and saying, oh, you know, this is a protected intersection? Yeah, just because you got to think with NACTO, NACTO is a great organization because it, it brings a cross-pollination of many people from all over. People from Denver and New York and New Orleans can come to a new city and see what that city's been working on. And if you are a city staff, and let's say you're a young city staff and you learn only from your supervisor, and that supervisor has never left the city for the last 30, 40 years, right? And they learn from their supervisor who's only been there for another 30, 30, 40 years. They've spent many generations of just saying no to stuff, right? And they, they, they never learned, saw anything new from a different city or what New York's doing. They might've been like, that's what you do in urban areas, but that's not gonna work in our small town. And you don't get that cross-pollination, but NACTO does that professionally um, with tours. But video is almost as good as a tour. And, 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 and a lot of times city staff would go to Street View to go look it up at stuff. But Street View is not always updated. The aerial maps are not always updated for all the cool stuff everybody's working on. But these videos on social media explaining it very, very simply that it, this just works um, really, really uh, hits home for a lot of uh, folks and uh, my clients. Um, we actually get hired by our clients to actually explain videos on projects. Some of the projects, videos I do, are some either hired videos or um, uh, we uh, scoped in that when we do the project that we actually will make videos with the city staff trying to talk about what the what this project is and what, why, how to use it. And uh, um, that's really uh, 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 that's really what we need. If you noticed in the pro the videos you just showed, we're using a bike box. Um, it's a green bike box, a two-stage bike box. It's an MUTCD compliant box. We could have done a different kidney-shaped island and made it a little bit more look like a protected intersection. But we reasonably used the boxes because the city was trying to standardize that facility and we could use this as an education piece. And so it's all about slowly getting people to just understand these facilities, how to use them, how to regulate them, how, teaching the police officers how to, how to uh, take the people in the, who are parking the bike lane, show people how to use the bike lane using a quick build, working with the fire department so they could drive over uh, these facilities. And whenever I talk to anybody, uh, any stakeholder, any community person, I always try to put myself in their shoes. What are their objectives, constraints, priorities? Um, with the fire department, their priority is response time. Their budgets are actually based on response time, how fast they can get to the actual site. And if you put in protected bike lanes, they feel that's a hindrance to them because that's holding back their budgets and response time. So talking to them about them getting a signal priority and they can drive over these posts in an emergency uh, was really what hit home for them. And I do that with everybody that I work with. That's great. So you also mentioned the state and uh, I did have a uh, deputy, deputy secretary or deputy director, I can't remember her official title, uh, Avital uh, Barnea on. Uh, and, uh, and recently there's been some good uh, stuff happening at the state level there in California, uh, loosening some of those requirements on the uh, required triggering of evaluations and things of that nature. So it's wonderful to see that hopefully, you know, that will smooth out that pathway and, and really, you know, encourage more of, of this type of work being done with less friction and less barriers uh, to, to doing active transportation projects. We're right there right now. Um, there's been many, many elements have come together to, to make it this way. We have level of service to VMT, which has been a big thing of just changing how we analyze traffic. And I'll explain that really briefly is level of service is a, is a, is a, is a how we analyze traffic. It's a density function, more cars, more delay. You keep widening, adding more lane, uh, more, uh, and, and, and to reduce, reduce congestion. And if a new development was being built, they were required to either pay fees to the city to widen the streets and improve the signals or for them to actually widen the, their, their frontage and widen the lanes, add right turn pockets. But that has no end because you just keep widening and traffic keeps coming back. 
And uh, so the city's changed to VMT, which is how to tell the developer, how do you reduce vehicle trips? So now the project that the developer does is a protected bike lane, maybe a bus stop, but that's a, a, a the, the developer now puts, a, puts in a protected bike lane or puts in a bus stop, or maybe they put in showers so people could bike and shower. Maybe they, they provide scooters to all their employees. Maybe they subsidize Uber, right? But these are different ways to try and reduce vehicle trips. And so that's happening now. And we have, we had, the state had DIB 89, which was a design bulletin on the highway design manual. It's kind of, for a lot of folks, you may not, may not understand, but you have to change the highway standards to actually go and affect our roadway because our roadway system came from highways. And, uh, and, and so by putting in a DIB 89, if you look at that, it's got a picture of protected intersection, a diagram that I think was made in Microsoft Word. Um, it's just a really crude diagram, but that diagram opened up the doors for engineers to start to innovate in this space. Um, was, was we we had already designed, uh, I think we had already designed around twenty protected intersections before that document came out, but that document helped solidify a lot of the work that we've been doing, and uh, and 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 so the combination of changing how we analyze traffic as part of environmental, the combination of these standards starting to be seen, and also many professionals like uh, myself interpreting those standards and actually implementing that kind of inspires both the state to set standards, the local cities to set standards, and more. Um, we still have things that we're fighting at the MUTCD level of, of right turn pockets and right turn pockets next to bike lanes. And I might do it differently than some other cities have done it. Some professionals may disagree with the way that I've done some of these things, and I might disagree with the way that they've done some things, but we're all professionals and we're, we're putting our licenses and insurance on the line. Um, and we're, we're developing these facilities that are uh, that are safe. And uh, I know that with the ways that we design our facilities that you would have to really try to uh, to swing around a corner and 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 and, and, and be intrusive like that. Uh, it's 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 really we, I'm proud to say that on all of our facilities we've had no fatalities or major crashes in any of the facilities that we've had in in San Jose. But as soon as you get outside of the downtown as our facilities end, that's when the crashes start. You know, even the San Jose mayor was hit by a right truck conflict right as soon as he got off of one of our bike lanes. So after he got on the bike lane and he went a few blocks down where there was no protection, that's where the crashes happen. And San Jose has uh, one of the highest amount of fatalities this year. Um, and, and I'd say a lot of that is because these facilities haven't spread out into the uh, other areas. And so we're at the right time where everybody's realizing Vision Zero, CEQA, VMT has changed. The developers are ready to build this kind of stuff. San Jose just now, because of all of these uh, regulation changes, is approving 34,000 new units, uh, housing units in North San Jose, which is a very underdeveloped area. And so right now, all of those areas will have protected intersections and protected bike lanes. Because if you want to have many people living near where they work, they have to be able to get there without a car. And so we're getting to this area where the planning, the land use, all of it is coming together. And I'm proud to be in the in the Bay Area where we've been progressive and we've been innovating in this space because now we can take a lot of lessons learned and go apply it to the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm I'm glad you mentioned uh, you know that particular change with the VMT and uh, that impact of uh, induced demand uh, that we have with you know the expansion of of, of lane miles. Um, have you done a, a, a VMT and a, an, an induced demand video yet? Yes, yes, we we we, okay. we do that analysis uh, on some of our projects, um, and uh, we a lot of our projects are are funded because of EMT. Um, we work with uh, a lot of these tech campuses that are tra trying to reduce their vehicle trips, part of their tra traffic demand measures, uh, okay. and we, they have shuttle buses and scooters. Um, we have some really innovative projects near some of these tech campuses, two-way cycle tracks on both sides of the street going through stop signs, which is actually not even in the new AASHTO guidance. That's, we've been waiting for the AASHTO guidance for about five, six years now. I reviewed it five, six years ago, but even in that the guidance, they don't even talk about stop signs. So we're still ahead of that. And um, all those intersections are working with big shuttle buses. So we have shuttle buses turning around two-way cycle tracks um, because we're trying to reduce the amount of vehicle trips to these campuses. Yeah. Have you done a TikTok? Yeah, I've done it. we did a TikTok this? about that one. Um, um, we have uh, more connections coming to that. Um, uh, we're going through the uh, c uh, last review process on, on another uh, few roads around that to fully complete it. But I, I have made a TikTok about that that uh, two way cycle track stop sign. Okay, and how about uh, a TikTok on uh, induced demand? Have you done that one yet? 
A little bit. I, I hint at that a few times and I, I okay. made videos. I made a video once. I just was, I think I was driving and I had the idea about how to explain it. So I just, I just did a quick little uh, short video. I was just showing the car traffic and this is what's happening post pandemic world. Yeah. Um, everybody enjoyed the, the, no, the low traffic before. And, um, but a lot of my videos aren't necessarily like on a specific topic like that. Right. It's just something is in your, in your driving, you're going off the ramp, you see the traffic and, explain just this little tidbit about what's going on. Um, I will I will eventually get to more content where I, I'd be like, this is a topic and we're gonna talk about everything about this topic for the for this video. But a lot of my videos just just make normalizing it in our day-to-day -day life. So when people go yeah. around the day-to-day -day life, they just, they, they think about it. When they see the sign, they think about it, be like, oh, yellow means a warning sign. I remember seeing a video about somebody talk about that. I didn't explain all the colors of the MUTCD, right? But I might've explained that one thing to them and that that's uh, people's for people's attention span and just to for them to learn they kind of need to learn i think a little slowly and um uh, somebody can take the time to just study all the material and do that but the average person's not going to do that um my yeah. goal with my TikTok is when we go to a community outreach meeting i want people to already know what we're talking about and be ready to engage you know i i felt very sad that when we go to community outreach meeting because you get the same people who come to the same every right. community outreach meeting and they come. They might even not even know what the project's about. They'd be like, "Oh, it's a bike project. Which where are we talking about today, right?" And there's a bunch yeah. of people who are living in that community who don't know anything about this, and they're coming. In, they're just trying to figure out what's happening. They're like, "You're taking away my parking. Why? You this cross? We need a crosswalk here, please, right?" And and for them, they don't know the they don't know the, the words. They don't know how to talk about it. And a lot of times. In outreach meetings, the first outreach meeting is just teaching people terms and terminology. Right. But do we need to be doing that? You know, uh, maybe the, maybe people should just get it, and we can just teach people subconsciously. And so that's what I've been doing with these these videos. And I found that people even bring up my videos in community outreach meetings. I've had other uh, uh, competitors be like, "Hey, somebody sent me, showed me your video, and said do this in our in our in our project." And I was like, "Yeah, well, that's what that, that's what they 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 feel they they need." And um, my goal is just to 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 reach as many people as as possible. Um, and uh, TikTok is so far has been very much an extension of my own personality uh, and then my own music and stuff that I enjoy. Uh, it's not all about engineering. A lot of it is just about me as well. And just, just like a lot of yeah. personal social media pages, but I do procure the content for other uh, platforms. So the LinkedIn, if, if, if folks want to get more of just a, a straightforward engineering content that, that is, is, is for educating professionals, that's where uh, you can find it on my LinkedIn and now my Twitter. Fantastic. That's great. Good stuff. I appreciate you for seeing what we're doing and and uh, and, uh, um, and for for uh, for helping us uh, just kind of how do I say reach the reach uh, the the reach different agencies and folks because I think a lot of people uh, need a, a much more simpler way of breaking down these kind of projects and it, we don't want it to just keep going over people's heads with the new infrastructure bill most of that bill is actually about outreach to equity uh, equity based outreach to different communities and the big part of that bill and a lot is is actually just bringing in community-based organizations to just figure out what the issues are but a lot of them won't even be able to facilitate that conversation honestly because they don't even know what the issues are in their community they may have something that they irks them, but they don't realize, oh, the reason our community is so aggressive is because we're all unprotected lefts, for instance, right? Or something like that, right? And so the, the, just teaching people about the different qualities of life is, is what I've been doing. And thanks for, thanks, for, thanks for bringing us on. Yeah, you are quite welcome. And, and I love it too, because in this format, it, it kind of feels like it's, since they're really short, it feels like it's like a little bit of a conversation. Somebody can quickly digest it and then, you know, absorb it and then comment on it and, and they're ready for that next little bit. So, uh, even though it's not truly a two way conversation and a dialogue, you know, on, on video, uh, it very much is, uh, in the platform. Yes. And it's helped me a lot learn how to respond, learn how to be concise. Um, I get a decent amount of hate online uh, too, uh, and just learning about how, what, what, what irks them, what can I do differently, you know? Uh, uh, if, if, if somebody says, somebody keeps commenting about certain things regarding certain driveways or car-centric design, I might even reach out to them and just kind of 
understand their perspective a little bit. So I actually follow back all my haters, you know, uh, and then and, and that they, then they so they kind of get brought into this space. And um, uh, it's a, I think I think that's really been a big value asset for me in my communication uh, is is just being uh, on the same level as other people. Well, thank you so much for doing what you are doing. Um, I'm inspired. Uh, I'll, I'll, for, for the last word, I'll leave it to you. Uh, any, any advice as to you know somebody like me who might you know is doing you know producing videos for for YouTube, but may want to dip my toe into uh, the TikTok world? I say um, having a, a big a good hook in the beginning is really important because the TikTok algorithm is based on watch time. So if your if your video is let's say it's 15 seconds and everybody's watching at the average watch time seven seconds, that means people are scrolling past. But if your video is 15 seconds and the average watch time is 20 seconds or 17 seconds, then people are re-watching it to learn something, right? And that's what makes a video do very well. So having a hook that can bring in people at, and and putting as much as you can and so maybe something even at the end of the video is really important. Uh, and I'd say you can also be memeified in a way. I use that word. Um, because like I start off everybody with like, Hey, Mr. Ba- hey, y'all, Mr. Barricade here is how I started off. And so people, when they see that, they're like, Oh, he's about to explain something. Right. And they do that. And so people can have different hooks. So, we, so when people get used to that, be like, Oh, I like this. I want to keep more of this. Whenever I see that, I know what's going to happen. Right. And you'll yeah. see that with people who joke or do other things, but that's, that's a, um, that's a big, big part of, of, of the TikTok platform. And also just don't get afraid of all the trolls. There's a lot of trolls. I'm sure you see some of that on YouTube, but it's way worse on TikTok because it's, it's more anonymized. I actually had some, a lot of, a lot of races Indian hate, uh, happened to me, went from two, 200,000 followers up until six, uh, 600,000 followers. It was, it was pretty bad. Um, I actually get like, I had to get some of the internet hate crime division involved because of, of doxing of addresses and Photoshopping of stuff. And, but it got pretty bad, and so you have to be fight through that. I think most people, when they go through a, a certain time, that you deal with a lot of that hate. And what I've learned is, if you're getting comments that are either hateful or people who just don't know or never seen your content before, that means you're doing well because you're reaching to a larger audience than you're used to reaching. You may be just talking to the same people, same people, same people. And if you have a video that does really well and it reaches the new people, and people are being odd, and those are comments that you've never seen before that means you're actually reaching to new people and you're doing right. well, you know? And for a lot of people on uh, on TikTok, they don't realize that until later, but it, you have to build a little bit of a thick skin on the internet. Um, and the kids can be mean sometimes, you know? And I remember like, I, there was a lot of this high school, middle school bullying that I just was like, I never dealt with that. I grew up in an Indian community here in the, in the Bay Area where I never was singled out my whole life. And then I go on the internet and I'm singled out. And I was just like, this is very, odd and then i realized that uh, that's actually what a lot of people deal with in different parts of the country and uh um, i didn't deal with that in my youth uh and so it was just very very new to me and so um i'd say just building a thick skin um uh when you when you go on there and knowing that you're you're doing if you're reaching new people you're doing well um and i will say there's also a lot of trends on tiktok that that are funny where people will have an audio and they'll Everybody will use that same audio, whether it's a clip from a movie or a clip from music, in their own niche. Somebody might talk about dating. Somebody might talk about uh, 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 them losing something or a bag, and they joke about it. But whatever, they're something relatable. And if you do that to your niche, you actually grow very well um, because you're reaching to new people that way. So that's a big part of, of that platform. Um, but just keeping it short and concise and kind of following different trends. Uh, and if you like something and you can put a smile on your face, people can feel that energy uh, through through the through the camera. I love it. I love it. Well, here here you go. Don't be uh, don't be surprised if in twenty twenty three, uh, Mister Active Towns comes to the the TikTok world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. I I I, I, I would uh, help promote your 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 content on the, on that platform. It's, we have a good community of urbanists and, and active transportation and city folks. Um, it's growing quite a bit on that platform because a lot of people see that point of view from people who go clean up rivers and clean up creeks to, uh, to folks who slurry seal contractors to uh, um, people who are uh, adjusting the signal heads on uh, uh, on the cranes. You know, there's a whole community of people who have cell phones 
in their pocket that are filming their day-to-day work and day-to-day life and going along with these music trends and 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 and, and different and, and different types of content and i think that's what's so unique about that platform we'll see what happens when uh the congress does what they do but I think more than Instagram and other platforms, it, 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 there's a, a very low barrier of entry to filming a quick video and, and putting it down. And I think there's a there's a there's a great community of of like-minded people who are are forming our own little audience there. One of the things that you said there that is incredibly important, and, and Jason Slaughter and I had this conversation. Um, Jason runs the YouTube channel, uh, not just bikes, is that you know once you do break out of the echo chamber, that bubble of, you know, the active transportation and urbanist and, and, uh, you know, realm, it, it's, it, it is kind of, it's a little scary, like you say, and, but it's, that's the whole point is you were getting the message to where the message really needs to go, which is outside of our little echo chamber. And that's, that's kind of new in our transportation realm. Sadly, yeah. um, I remember having community outreach meetings, a young engineer and the city would tell me, Hey, we want to have the meetings at 3 PM. So we don't have to hire a translator. And I remember being like, what? Okay, I guess I was a young engineer. And I was like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing, right? Is having a meeting at 3 p.m. So we just get a few people and we just talk to them and just to show face that we're doing the outreach. That's not good, you know, and we shouldn't be doing that. And now we have our meetings at 6 p.m. We have daycare so single mothers can come. We have food raffle, uh, we have food and we have a raffle. We have multiple translators. It's on Zoom. We even have a pop-up facility. We bring out the different posts. We have the kids ride around the post and draw chalk green bike lanes and stuff like that. And that's kind of the way we, we have to go towards outreach. And um, we have to constantly just reach new people. And now with the social media, or reaching all these new people and trolls who maybe don't like us and just want to say something crude, maybe about your appearance or about what you're talking about. Um, I, I have, uh, I make, sometimes I have to make friend only videos and I have to tell people who are my mutual say, Hey, um, I'm, I have a few videos that are getting popular right now. I'm getting a lot of weird 9-11 comments and stuff like that. Can you guys just kind of combat that in my comment section? Cause I don't want that to get affect the engineering content. You know, and right. yeah, like I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Hindu American. That's just, just the wrong type of racism, even, right? And so it's, 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 it's but that's just what you get uh, online. And so uh, just making sure you kind of tame that. Um, I had a funny thing, actually, I'll say this. When I was dealing with a lot of hate in the beginning, and I was just transferring from doing the dance videos to the, the engineering videos, I didn't know how to deal with the hate. And it was just coming at me from all angles, a lot of it. And uh, just a lot of slurs and a lot of just weird comments and, and stuff like that. And I, I, I decided to build like a little internet cult of, of, of friends. And I told all my fans, if you want to be my friend, change your profile picture to an MUTCD traffic control sign. And I showed the MUTCD's chart and I was like, go choose whatever sign you want. And if, you, if I see you with the sign, I'll add you as my friend. And then um, I had all these people young people change their profile pictures to these signs. They change from like uh, uh, ch- chain zone ahead to slippery when wet and, and all kinds of funny stuff, right? But then I made friend only videos and be like, hey, I want you guys to help me. I'm dealing with a lot of harassment and bullying. Can you just help me with this? And if you see that happen to anybody else, combat that. We want to be anti-racist. And if you see anything that's like that, just don't just combat that. And that helped a lot because what happened is if somebody gave some really crude comment and people would see the video, me talking about engineering, and they'll see something really obnoxious. They would like that obnoxious comment. And I'd come back after a day's work of not looking at my phone and be like, why did I get 10,000 likes on a racist comment on one of my engineering videos, right? And I would feel very sad about that. Mm-hmm. That was just America. That's the world we live in, right? And this was during 2020, during the crazy time of 2020, um, uh, 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 2021. And... Uh, um, I, uh, uh, I realized that if, if, if one of my followers says, don't talk to Mr. Barricade that way or talks back to that person quickly, like as right. soon as they see it, then that comment doesn't go viral. Then the response goes viral, right? So then I come back and I might see somebody make a 9-11 comment and I say, somebody says, don't talk to Mr. Barricade that way. This is an engineering video. And then that gets more likes than the, that comment. But if that, if that response is not there, it's really easy for someone to be like, oh, ha ha, and just scroll on, right? And so I, that's why I got rid of a lot of that hate and I built a big community um, and I think that's kind of what you need to do on these platforms is build a community that supports you and then you grow and you get to new places and you 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 uh, see new uh, and, and you constantly grow and for me I'm a I'm a CAD engineer right I don't didn't do social media 
and I didn't know any of this was going to happen to me. Yeah. And it just it happened so accidentally, and now I'm using it as a as like my superpower uh, for my company. And half our business comes from the social media now. Um, but uh, for me, being an engineer, and I have most of my days in AutoCAD designing, approving, redlining plans, doing calculations and stuff like that. This is pretty new, but I think it's helped me grow as a professional, um, knowing that when I go to different communities, I may be judged, I may be perceived differently. I have to explain things in a certain way to car centric people or truck drivers. And I, uh, um, I've i seen that uh, online. There was a time when my account was actually removed because I was dealing so, with so much hate. Um, I just uh, the, the, the TikTok platform at the time was banning a lot of minority creators just because a lot of people were reporting their pages and they learned to combat that. They made an apology and they brought back a lot of people who accidentally got banned. And I was one of those people who got my account removed at 500,000 followers just for making engineering content and stuff for that. And when, while I got banned, I uh, rallied my community to say, hey, email TikTok and say, why did I get banned? And I remember this one video that I thought made me laugh is this, it was a trucker. And he's in his car, right? And he's like, why did they ban Mr. Barricade? He did, oh, he does his engineering car. He taught me that we have to care about room for our feet on the road. You know, like we have to have space for our feet to walk. I did not know that, you know? And I was just like, yes, you know, like we, we were, we're reaching all these people who would not ever know to care about bikes or crosswalks or sidewalks or side paths. And here's a trucker who probably would have hated bikes and hated pedestrians before and now is like i see the value in that it makes sense if they're out of my way i can get where i need to go and it's clear right and i'm explaining it that way and i i found that's really motivating to me is i'm reaching all these new people i see people respond to me in spanish in many different countries um i make videos about all kinds of subjects related to engineering and i think everybody's uh everybody's able to see that hey we're all related and i'll give i'll, I'll say one more thing is is Gen Z is a is a very new generation than how you and I grew up. You know, when we grew up, we probably got our car at 16 or 18. We went out with our friends. We painted a town, you know, and came came back. And we had a very that was our upbringing, and that's how we interacted with infrastructure, right? Is by driving or biking or going out with your friends or hanging out under bridges or whatever we used to do, going on hiking trails and stuff like that. But this newer generation, they did not get that opportunity. You know, either through economic issues or the pandemic, they actually got their experience with infrastructure through GTA and video games. You know, and that's their first time that they drove a car. You know, that's the first time that they interacted with a crosswalk was actually through a video game. And so, there's a common joke in the in the in the in 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 the, in, in, in the Gen Z community of something called an NPC. I don't know if you've heard this before, but an NPC is a non-player character. So you are the main character in this world or in the simulation and everybody else who's crossing the street who you don't react with are just computer generated non-player characters like in a gta game right and so that's a very common joke on the internet just part of their culture right and so they actually get hey i want the user interface of the map of this video game to work well for me Right? I want to make sure the crosswalks work, the signals work and stuff like that so they can play the video game of life. And it's sad that that's how they relate to the world is through video games and simulations and videos. But that's really how they grew up uh, with the pandemic and more. And so a lot of young people who were entering college, they went to college with the pandemic. They went to high school with the pandemic for two, three years, right? And so their interaction with infrastructure actually has been sometimes even through my videos, you know? And, They'd be like, oh, I never knew I could. That was a water channel until I saw that in GTA San Andreas. And now I'm seeing that in your video. And I'm like, no, I'm just in Santa Monica. Like, what are you talking about? Right. But they just haven't had those experiences like I had as a teenager and right? as a young adult um, exploring the world. And uh, um, that's kind of the new generation's mindset. And so resonating with that about caring about our user interface, resonating with that about this is how you cross. Sometimes I even joke about the NPCs. I'd be like, look at all these people who are crossing the crossroads. They just know what to do as if they're programmed that they know what to do, right? And that's really part of the, 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 the newer generation's life and humor. And I think cities need to understand that if they're going to talk about our interface because a lot of this stuff will go over their head if they don't understand that that's how people's humor and that's how people were raised during the pandemic. Good stuff. Well, Mr. Barricade, you're my superhero here. <laughs> and... Uh... 
and hopefully we'll encourage more of that uh, that generation uh, to get out into the real world and experience some of the wonderful infrastructure that you're building. Again, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Oh, thank you. Hey, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Vignesh Swaminathan, Mr. Barricade. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, again, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. That really helps out a lot. And uh, if you are so inclined, uh, please consider supporting me out on Patreon. Well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>